Hello. Hello. Kind of a seven out of ten, that one. Hello. Hello. A bit more of a nine out of ten. That's good. Um, just because it's after lunch um, and we're going to get to work with each other really for the next hour and a half or so, I'd just like you to put your pens and notebooks down. And um, in the next 20 seconds, say hello and shake hands with as many people as you can around the room. And your time starts now. Go and fast. <laughs> Stay standing. Go the, go the distance. Go the distance. Good. Good. Nice hello. to meet you. Hi, Nick. All right. Hello. Hi. Good. Hello. 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 You're up on stage there. <laughs> Hi. All right. Stop there. Stay standing. Stay standing. Stay standing. And if you have not already found an individual to work with, once they start, they're hard to stop. <laughs> <laughs> just find one other person to work with or a trio would also work but pairs perhaps a little bit better just decide who that person is now so you're just finding one other person Julian I'll need you so can't you can't be in that yeah so and say hello shake their hands and introduce yourselves good so one other person in a pair would be ideal good have you got one other person to work with you do need that excellent um, Julian, yes. I'll choose you, I think, to work with, my colleague Jules. All right, so, you know, we're going to go on this client experience journey in the next hour and a half, so we might as well, I thought, start the journey here, and you're going to be doing the same with your partner. I'll do this with, with, with Julian, first of all, though. So, Julian, I quite fancy going to Hawaii for a trip. Yes, and... No, no, I think once more with feeling. Oh. Okay, so I, I, I quite fancy going to Hawaii for a nice trip. Yes, and why don't we go to the highest volcano that we can go to? Yes, and what about paragliding off the top of that volcano? Yes, and while we're coming down, we land in a pool next to the bar. It always ends in alcohol. <laughs> it always ends in alcohol. But you get the idea, right? So decide who is A and B, and if you've got a C, who C is in your group. Okay, decide that now. Who's A and B? Decide that now. Quick, quick, quick. <laughs> a, who is A and who's B? Or who's C? Okay, good. Um, and B... All you have to do is simply select now in your mind a destination you'd love to go to, and then you're just going to pose that to the uh, uh, person you're working with. And that person, th their role is to build on that idea. The key term is, here is yes, and we could also do and um, choose the adventure. Choose your adventure. Ready, steady, go. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> okay, stop there, but stay standing. Stay standing. <laughs> time, time, time. Okay. So how many of you ended up at a bar? A good proportion of you, I'm sure. Um, maybe this couple over here, where did you start and where did your adventure take you? Could you give us a sense of that? Uh, we started at a beach in Thailand. Yep. Uh, scuba diving. We did nothing for a whole day. Then we went scuba diving and then we swam around night. Okay, I'm finding out about how you roll there, lovely. Um, what about over here? Where did you start and where did you end up? Uh, we went to Paris. Yep. There was a lot of eating and drinking. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> Oh, okay. Just better fit that in at the end there. Okay. And inside story. Okay. Take a seat. Original seats or new seats. Up to you. <clears throat> I'm not going to spend too much time debriefing this exercise, but, you know, we need some energy after lunch. Good to start that way. Um, a journey with a destination. That, well, that's going to kind of be important to the uh, um, uh, agenda that we've got laid out for us in the next hour and a half or so. And then the, there's that lovely yes and statement as well, so building on those ideas, which is also important for the work we're going to be doing together. So here's a bit about CX and law um, in terms of the firms, the type of firms we help and what we do with them, um, essentially, um, and what we've learnt over the last four, five, six years, even starting in the UK, was really this all comes back down to the service culture. 
It's all about behaviours, our outlook, the kind of things we've been talking about, our skills, our behaviours, and that intent we've got, um, perhaps as a team, a, a legal team, um, to service our clients remarkably well. Um, and essentially, you know, law, law is really, for many of us, and I, I'd like to make this point, that law is really just something that we happen to be doing <laughs> now, right? Because most law firms have kind of got that down, right? They're kind of good at that already, yeah? Um, if I threw a stone off the top of Ashurst building in London where I work, the, the international firm, I would hit equally brilliant lawyers. There was no, not a single client saying there were not enough lawyers to choose from. All right. So with that in mind, you know, I, perhaps the mission now is to turn as many of our clients into promoters as we can. I would suggest that is your new goal. That's your new mission. And I guess, again, that's what we want to explore this afternoon. Now, of course, working for a firm like Ashurst, as I did in London for seven years, um, we got to work on some really amazing projects. Um, one of those projects was the Olympic Bid Committee. So we were involved in the Olympic bid for the 2012 Games, um, and we were assisting Seb Co in the pitch for that and so on, the chairman of the Games. Um, and in the end, he spoke about this lovely phrase, um, games makers, which is one of the reasons why I also wanted to start like this with some energy and working together. Games makers. Um, for him and for the 2012 Games, it's about getting as many of the volunteers together, Londoners and people from all around the country, who could also bring this Olympic event to life as much as it was about the athletes and about the audience. So this concept of games makers. Now, the reality of that in law, at least up, up till now, thereabouts, has been it's been virtually impossible, <laughs> in my experience coming from learning and development, that background, to get lawyers and that phrase, which is now infamous and that I hate, non-lawyers, <laughs> into one room to focus on, um, you know, how we deliver to our clients. Um, but more and more, and again, this has been spoken about throughout today, this is about getting the interdisciplinary teams together. It's about all roles and functions coming together to, to have a focus on um, the client. In fact, the client needs to be in everyone's line of sight. You know, my background before law was theatre. You know, we're all actors on this stage. We all bring that to life. We all have a part to play. So that's important, but often difficult to achieve, I think. Um, but that's where I wanted to start. Championing service at every level uh, across the organization and how we go about doing that, bringing this to life. Um, you know, it's interesting that, that our office is around the corner here. Um, there's a, a college of law um, or a law college on the lower ground floor. And then there's the Apple training rooms. And in, in between, we have an office space there. Um, but, you know, Apple train their staff for two or three weeks before they ever step foot on the sales floor in everything we're talking about here right now. Yeah. So they, they you know, they have intent, they, they, they have training and, and they have focus on how they bring their sales performance, which is another phrase I really like, the sales or service performance to life. So I think there are things we can learn um, outside of law, of course, about how we need to do and what we need to do here within the legal sector. Um, and going back to a point that was made by Mel earlier today about empathy, I think one of the first points of empathy that we could possibly um, think about, and this is really important when you know, a firm is trying to build this focus on, on the client and on the customer, is our own experience as a customer, funnily enough. It's actually the most perfect starting point because even the most ever so sophisticated client you know, um, particularly for those big international city firms, isn't it the case that really any of those, all of those are actually just like, just customers like you and I of other service providers, would you agree? Yeah? Um, so it's a really important viewpoint and point of empathy is to bring everyone back to the idea that actually, oh, we, we, we all experience service every day. And increasingly we are more and more attuned to that level of service, aren't we? Yeah? So I still get stupidly excited by the idea that um, when I order a Domino's pizza, pizza, which I don't do often, by the way, but you know, when I do, that I can see that there's a pizza tracker, isn't there? You know, <laughs> online, you can design your own pizza. I mean, it's, uh, you know, pizza tracker, design it online. Um, it's in the oven, you know? It's cooking for this long, it's out of the oven, it's on the bike. <laughs> you find out about the person driving the bike to you. 
um, you know, you can see on the map, like which directions are going to go. Now, pee in highway or left or you know, avoid the roadworks. And in the meantime, you come like, okay, and then Netflix, warming up the plates, you know, like waiting for your pizza to arrive. So I do get excited about this stuff. Um, but again, you know, your clients, your customers, they may have ordered Domino's pizza last night, you know? And they're actually going to be bringing that expectation, the expectations of themselves as customers, to a professional service firm. Are they not? Really? Because, you know, if you're spending $50,000 or more, millions, on a legal service, and actually the night before I could track my pizza... <laughs> oh, look, here, here it comes. Oh, that's where it is right now. Um, and then you cannot do any of that with the law firm because they are virtually inaccessible. You know, where are things at any one point? Yeah? Matter delivery. And we work with a, a firm in New Zealand, actually, who, you know, they look at Air New Zealand as their, their role model. I'm going to ask you this question in a minute about who you might role model or choose to avoid. But they role model Air New Zealand, and why, would, why wouldn't they? They're an award-winning airline for hospitality. You expect the plane to reach its destination more often than not. <laughs> so that's no longer kind of a deal breaker. <laughs> so therefore, you know, fingers crossed, it's the experience on board that you're looking at. You know, Ryanair versus Air New Zealand and so on. So they role model um, hospitality. And I think this is also a really important point for us to consider. The point around perhaps today, you know, it's more about care beyond the legal advice, to go back to the empathy. Isn't today much more about care beyond the legal advice? Perhaps it's about concierging the client through their matter. Because again, you know, if you speak to the LPLC, if you speak to the Ombudsman, there's very few complaints or fewer complaints about black letter law, really. <coughs> Most of it's about communication. It's about the handling of the matter, <coughs> concierging the client. So again, just have a brief chat with anyone around you now in terms of your own experience as a customer. And this is what I, I would encourage you to have the same conversation with people back at work, by the way, because it's a great starting point. But have that discussion and just come up with one or two, I guess, examples of a service you've experienced that you would actually role model. You, role model. you could say, well, there are things we can learn and also perhaps an example of one where You'd absolutely, you loathe it. You'd absolutely want to not role model that service. And just, you know, just two minutes, have that conversation now. Like and loathe. Service you like and loathe, role model, not role model. <laughs> Clearly, service is quite a, a topic you feel passionate about because actually stopping you from having those conversations is quite difficult. Um, look, we probably don't have quite enough time to, to get examples, but you're getting into that conversation, right? You, you, I guess the point here is we all know what good service looks like don't we? And how it feels. And we want more of it. Is that fair to say? And we also know what poor service looks like and how that feels and we want less of that. Although perhaps we really enjoy complaining about it. <laughs> well, you are if you're, if you're a Brit like me, you really enjoy complaining about it. Um, you know, there are a couple on here that you'd absolutely want to avoid. I mean, it's surprising actually when you look at this whole area that, you know, law firms, and we'll explore this a little bit, law firms make their own clients go ouch so often without realizing it, it's shocking. And really, you know, we can be talking about innovation, we can talk about design thinking and all that jazz, right? But a lot of this is actually just remedial. It's remedial. Service basics. Getting the service basics right could be, if you're a firm in the room, your most remarkable differentiator in the market. And it's funny because we, we spoke with a, a large corporate client of a boutique firm that we're working with. And she said, yeah, look, I have these conversations with my panel law firms um, and they're good. But very few, if any, have ever spoken to us actually about customer service and how important customer service is to the everyday operation and how we feel about the organization, the legal organization delivering the service. It's really fascinating. So we have all these conversations about the commercial acumen, you know, understanding the sector and all those wonderful topics. But actually, what about the day-to-day -day interactions and service delivery? Um, so making our own clients go out, we probably want to avoid the United Airlines approach, you know, kind of uh, putting the cat or the dog, was it, in the overhead compartment, it dies, throwing a guitar out of the hole. So did you see the YouTube? Um, and it breaks, so therefore a song was written about it and it went viral. 
beating a doctor up because the plane is overbooked. You probably want to avoid all of those things, but it's surprising how often that kind of thing happens in the legal sector and often without, with complete neglect from law firms about, about that actually occurring, that or similar. So there is a service reality, I think, that we need to square up to if we are a legal provider. And there's lots of good information on this, this slide. But perhaps for now, we'll just focus on this here, the 4% and the 96%. Because you know the topics um, today have spent a little bit of time on, again, empathy, adopting the client's perspective, understanding clients better, insight, and so on. Um, I find it fascinating that, you know, most customers or clients, if they're truly unhappy, clearly you know about it. <laughs> but most, if they're kind of unhappy or kind of satisfied or it's okay, yeah, then they won't really tell you about that and you lose an opportunity potentially to find out more. Um, and we should be encouraging those conversations with our, with our clients. I had a really personal experience here back in, in London. Uh, it's actually probably the origin story for CX and law by and large. I've been using a law firm for about seven years. Um, it included buying some property, selling some property. Um, it included um, the conclusion of a long-term relationship, someone I was with for nine years. Um, and they helped me along with that as well. And then all I came to do was something very simple was just to extend the leasehold on one of the properties in the portfolio. And I just wasn't quite as satisfied, and that's interesting, I think. Well, I wasn't dissatisfied, I just wasn't quite satisfied enough. Like, customer satisfaction, client satisfaction is not good enough today, by the way. Client satisfaction surveys, I mean, what? It's not about satisfaction, it's about, you know, remarkable today, because we're in the experience economy. Um, so I called this law firm up, who I've been using. And I said, oh, hello, hi, it's Carl, I'm a client. I'd like to give some feedback, please. What do you think was the response immediately on the phone reception? Oh, shit. Yeah, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite. They referred you to Martin. Martin. Oh, yeah, nice, that, that, that's nice. Well, that would have been quite good, actually. But there was kind of an audible sense of confusion, you know, like, um, um. And the response was, well, we don't have anyone here who deals with feedback. It's really, is it? <laughs> No, no, no. Uh, but we do have, I love this, we do have a partner who deals with complaints, the complaints partner. I love that. <laughs> Law firms love this kind of thing. Yes, we've ticked the box. A complaints partner. Thank you. Done. All right. Oh, a customer service initiative. Yes, we did that 16 years ago. So, so, tick. Right. Mm -hmm. Design thinking. Yes, we had one workshop. We now understand it. Tick. Done it. Right. Um, so I thought, OK, right. OK, let me try and get in touch with the partner who deals with complaints. Do you think I was able to? <laughs> Any ideas, no? Um, so what would you now be doing in my, so again, point of empathy, put your, your client hat on here. This is a bit of, again, bit of design thinking, put your hat on here. What's going on in your mind? Getting annoyed? Getting ang angry, yeah, okay. So it's interesting this, isn't it? Because I wasn't angry before. I was satisfied. I was wanting to be helpful by giving some nice feedback. Now I'm angry. So what was not a complaint is now one, which is funny, isn't it? And then um, I escalated it. Here's the thing as well. Go, goes back to your conversations in pairs around how passionate you are about good and bad service. I chose to escalate it because that's now what we do. So I went to the website and I thought, who is the managing partner? No, no, I wasn't that important to know who the managing partner was as a client. So I emailed this managing partner I said, hello, I'm a client, and I'd just like to give some feedback. I wasn't like being a service terrorist or anything like that. And I didn't hear anything until about 24 hours later when I did. And the email I received uh, was from the managing partner. I'd received it in error. <laughs> this should be striking the fear of God into you. En route to who, do you think? The complaints partner. Thank you, yeah, the complaints partner. <laughs> and I know I'm really building this up. It might be a bit of a letdown, but anyway, I'm never really... <laughs> Um, but, you know, one of the lines in that email was, bloody, 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 blah, should we take this client seriously? I really want you to get into this story. I really want you to feel the ouch. I really want you to feel empathy for me. <laughs> so now, um, I guess the question could be, what a wonderful, you know, 
critical incident actually to be talking about within the firm. By the way, none of that happened in this firm. But um, now I guess we could think about what would you have done if you were me? I moved to Australia, it was that bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what could you have done as a law firm? Discuss in your pairs. What, what would you have done, or what, or what would you have done as the, as the client of this firm? Seven years, blah, blah, blah. What would you, or could you have done as the law firm to salvage the situation? Because he probably realised I'd been copied in. Go on, have that discussion. I think that that is probably the origin story of CX and law. I, I, was, I was so livid about that situation that, you know, one of the most annoying things was it made it very inconvenient for me then. Because now on principle, and perhaps you came to this decision as well, you can't carry on using that law firm, can you? How could you? How could you? Unless there was some kind of effort on behalf of the managing partner, which I'm sure you also discussed. Ever so sorry you received that email, he might have said. I'd really welcome the opportunity to have a discussion or some such. That wasn't forthcoming in any way, shape or form. They're probably to this day completely unaware that that happened. And if it wasn't for my professional integrity, I would absolutely tell you who that law firm is. <laughs> Um, so, it's interesting, isn't it? Yes, design thinking. Yes, you know, design opportunities and whatnot. But please, let's just look at how we run our business. Um, let's think about our service delivery. Let's begin to see the world from the client's point of view. Um, which again is all part of this wider discussion we're, we're, we're having and we're having here. Um, so client experience in the end is an accumulation of all of these moments of truth. That was a big moment of truth at the end of a matter. This is McCulloch Robertson, actually, a firm we're working with. Um, lovely picture of smiling faces and, you know, you get a sense of who they are and what they might be, might be like to deal with, don't you? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I think that's a really important point that a client experience is any moment where an impression of what you do is formed on behalf of someone else, you know, when they see you, when they interact with you, any and all touch points with your, with your firm or with your business, um, that's where it all comes to life. And it's sometimes too much good fun <laughs> working in this area with, with, with Julian because, you know, you, you sit in reception areas of law firms and the world goes by, you know. Again, with my theatre background, law firms often forget that they're, they're, they're on stage. They're on stage. That reception is a stage, it's lit up. You know, if you're a prospective client of a firm making first contact, the law firm is auditioning for the role. They're auditioning for the role of service provider and everyone in the law firm should understand that, as opposed to what typically happens and our mystery shopping team, who we have in the background, have contacted dozens of firms in the work we do, instead of what we do experience, which is the sound of inconvenience on behalf of most law firms at the first point of contact. Or if you go into a large personal injury firm that you might be familiar with, um, lovely gleaming reception area, and you notice, um, because it's the personal injury firm, that someone who is injured comes through the door that you walk to very easily because you're able-bodied, and the person who's clearly injured because she has a plaster on her arm struggles to open the door, the glass door, <laughs> of this lovely reception area and then is rather abruptly dealt with by the receptionist who just indicates the seating area. Which when you arrive at the seating area, you realise, if you were her, that actually it's one of those very fancy looking seating areas, but you have to sit really low. You know, it's just completely not usable, it's uncomfortable. And I just think that's really, that observation right there is so powerful, isn't it? You know, here we have a personal injury firm injuring its own clients with their front door. <laughs> Yes, the ultimate, yeah. There is a, there is a madness, there's a, there's a Trump cleverness in that. <laughs> yeah, it's brilliant. in fact, it's brilliant. Um, but what was interesting, when we spoke with this firm about that, the HR director, she said, oh my gosh, you know, we all come through that same door every day, i.e. I, the team, all, all, all staff come through that door every day, and none of us have noticed how heavy that front door is to our own reception area glass door, unnoticed, you know. Every moment um, on the client's journey. Where are we going next? Ah, oh, yes, okay. 
So, again, little opportunities to get us warmed up because toward the end of the session, we really are going to go for it. So little, little um, exercises to warm us up. Some of you who've come to what, one or two of these presentations before have seen this statement, but I like it. It's the law firm service statement. <laughs> <laughs> there it is up in lights. I dare you to go to any law firm website and find anything different. <laughs> Maybe some of you are thinking, oh, yes, that's my law firm. Oh, yes, it's probably <laughs> everyone's law firm. So again, I know the point is that, you know, everyone can have one of these and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it's how we bring that to life, isn't it? It's how we bring the service statement to life. Um, how does this look and sound? Well, just as a little design conversation, I'd like you to, again, in your pairs, consider this statement. And consider in your pairs which element of this statement kind of really stands out to you. It sets an expectation. If you were a client or a prospective client, about to make contact with a law firm, you've been recommended, you've seen the statement, which of these words stand out to you as setting an expectation? Have that discussion in your pairs. In addition to that, I'd like you just to come up very quickly with five expectations you might have of first contact with this law firm. Picking up the phone, your expectations might be of the first conversation you might have based on this statement. I'm just going to give you three minutes or so to do that now quickly. So it doesn't matter if you've actually you know, completed the exercise, you might not have a list of five, doesn't matter. Um, which of these uh, words or phrases just stand, up, stand out to you as kind of, you know? Oh, first class. Oh, very nice. Okay, very nice. Uh, first class. All right. So um, <laughs> one of the um, managing partners is here from Perth. We've, run, we've done some work with her. said, well, today we have to live up to our own bullshit, don't we? <laughs> right? So, you know, as a law firm, you have to live up to your own bullshit. Now is not the time anymore to be throwing statements like this around and actually not delivering upon them because we won't put up with it as clients. It's a buyer's market. So, you know, um, we need to understand how that looks and feels. So what does first class mean to you? Premium, Premium which means? Expensive. Expensive, which means? Good. Fabulous. Fabulous, OK, yeah. We're sort of talking about it as the first class business airline lounge experience. Oh, pointy end. Yeah, so right. they know your name, they know all the details about why you're there, where you're flying, what you're Right, doing, they remember the you, taste of the coffee, crockery, the, all, of that stuff. all of that stuff. Silver service. Silver service, nice. I, I know, know how you like to roll. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. <laughs> typical, typical flight for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, nice. Sadly, yeah, and of course, so it does set an expectation first class, doesn't it? And uh, those who know me know that the opposite of first class is walking into a law firm, uh, into a reception. I do talk a lot about receptions, don't I? I'm sorry. But, um, and there's a bottle of hand sanitizer on the reception top. It's oh. hmm. kind of weird. First class. It's a first class bottle of hand sanitizer right there. Um, I don't even have a bottle of hand sanitizer or a call bell even. That's another one of my, my pet hates. Can I ring for attention, please? My very expensive professional service firm. Someone around? Ding. Um, no. But anyway, back to the hand sanitizer. You know, you don't even have that in establishments where you go and eat stuff. <laughs> so what does this suggest to your client if you have one in your reception area? <laughs> You're dirty. Let me just put my rubber gloves on first before I deal with my clients. Hardly first class, is it? There are never, no reason do you have to have hand sanitizer on the tabletop. Um, all right, so what did I ask you? I asked you for your expectations. Um, just chat, give me one or two expectations, things are on your list that you, you want to experience. Friendly. When you, friendly, okay, yeah, yeah, friendly tone of voice. I wouldn't be able to understand her advice because that's the one she'd understand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not an idea. Yeah, so what, what does that actually mean in reality? Yeah, so I guess we want to make progress, whatever acute understanding may mean. Any other things on your wish list? Ease of working. Ease of working, yeah. Which actually starts with a big customer service cliche, isn't it? Which is actually picking up the phone, if that's the way you're communicating. Oh, let's actually do that within three rings. Firms say, um, oh, responsiveness. Very sophisticated, oh, they love that word, responsiveness. But actually, if we can't actually pick up the phone within three rings, what on earth does that say about responses, responses right off the bat? Um, I really like practical because 
the rest of it is all about law, law, law. But I want to know how that actually applies to my problem. I don't yeah. want to be told Section 32. I want to be told yeah. yes or no. Yeah. So yeah. Right or wrong, do it or don't do it. Right. Relevant, relevant to me. Absolutely. Um, so you don't ask for much, do you? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so, but it, I mean, it is shocking, or maybe not so shocking for you, um, how actually little of that is experienced at first touch. I mean, it's, and, 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 and this is where, again, we, we get so excited because it's such a massive opportunity just to get those, those touch points right. I mean, the impact on revenue, just getting those touch points right is just mind blowing because most firms don't do it so well. They may or may not use technology, they may or may not use Certify, they may or may not use Law Switch, they may or may not use the chatbot, etc. But really all we're trying to do is have a good first conversation and, the, and how hard firms make it to do business with themselves is oftentimes quite, really quite shocking. And all we're talking about here, just to underline it, and as we move into this journey mapping um, uh, area, is you know the point in the five stage client journey which we will unpack a little bit of you know a new client considering a firm and then going on through the engagement process with the firm and all of those touch points that either come to life really well or don't come to life at all and there's there's a huge amount of uplift possible right here from the director of the first impression your receptionist you know, who you should absolutely be auditioning for the role. But by the same token, the lawyers who never pick up the phone and therefore it becomes a huge embarrassment factor for the receptionist or the director of first impression because no one cooperates with, we've got a new client coming through here. Is anyone available or are, all, are we all lawyers out to lunch? <laughs> Confirming a preconception we have about law, right? Through to the actual lawyer conversation you know. Oh, hello. Is that, is that Julian? Yes, it is. Hello, Julian. I understand you're calling about a really important commercial matter. Is that right? It's incredibly important. Thank you. As opposed to what? <laughs> <laughs> Which we've heard in our mystery shopping experiences. Um, right now, like yesterday. Right, one of the largest firms in Australia. Commercial work, corporate work, private client work. What? Or um, alternatively, Carl White. That's probably closer to things you're familiar with, maybe. <laughs> Have you even done that yourself? Pick up the phone, Carl White. And you know, it's that sound of inconvenience again, isn't it? And it's, there, there is an inside story which comes back to all of those lovely points from earlier today around you know, intent, engagement, um, everyone's involved in the games making. Affidavit mode, affidavit mode, incoming call. What is the kind of mode? So we're just talking about the first part of the journey here. But overall, what we need to be thinking about is demonstrating our service promise at each touch point. So this is quite nice. And again, it's a lovely exercise to do with your team. You know, you could actually kind of go, do we say anything about what we do? You could say. You could go and grab your service statement. You could sit in the team meeting and kind of go, oh yeah, here's what we say about ourselves. You could then say, right, so are we a nine, you know, are, are we an always organization? We always deliver that, what we say we do? Are we a usually organization? Are we a sometimes organization? Or are we a never organization in terms of delivering what it is we actually say we do? Brilliant starting point for a you know, really engaged conversation. And then you could move on and say, right, well, given we say this, what does that look like? What does that sound like? Well, there you go. That's the structure for that conversation. You know, what, what does the client see or visualize at that touch point? What does the client feel having dealt with you at that touch point? What does he or she hear? And of course, importantly, what do we want them to go on and do after having had contact with you? Fantastic conversations to have, after which immediate action can be taken. We don't need to go into a four week design exercise for this to have an impact. Conversation, engagement, action, you know, through awareness. Ah, oh, hello, is that Julian? Done. Yeah.
If we don't do it well, um, I know some of you will be familiar again with this slide, but it's so, so important. We're either going to turn our clients into detractors. I know this is an attractive looking detractor. Um, we're either going to turn them into Simon Cowell from X Factor, who's giving you that look, or just to connect you back with the start of the session, our, our goal, because we've got the law, it's not your differentiator anymore, please. It's not. There are brilliant lawyers all around. So we, what we need to do is turn clients into promoters. And I say that knowing that um, law is a grudge purchase. All right. So rarely will we be jumping up and down going, yay, we've just engaged a really expensive firm. Well, we've engaged any firm, to be frank. We wouldn't engage law firm unless we had to, really. Until we get to the point, I suppose, where we're in partnership with a firm, you know, they're, they're partner with something we're doing, they're perhaps exploring an opportunity with us and so on and so forth. But normally a grudge purchase. So I get the fact that not every client at the end of a match is going to kind of go, hey, and say how amazing it may be. Some will. Um, it might just be, you know, I got the result I got. And... I'm just really appreciative of the level of support from, the, from my firm. It was fantastic. You know, and as I say that, you know, the hairs on the back of my neck are standing up. It's a point of empathy. The support I got was fantastic. Promoter, promoter, who then goes on and promotes. This is your mission, by the way. Minimize detractors, deal with your neutrals, see if we can get those neutrals to promoters. OK, um, the sound this person makes goes like this. Hmm. Remember that sound? Hmm. Um, the sound that the Fonz makes, we know, but it might just sound like this. Hmm. That's really important, that sound. Every one of your team needs to know and understand that sound. They'll know it because they've been a customer. Hmm. That was a bit more surprising than I thought. That was a bit nicer than I thought. When I bought that coffee this morning, that person actually acknowledged me and it was efficient. Hmm. That person picks up the phone. That's your mission. The mission is to make every client as often as possible go, hmm. That was a little bit better than I thought because what we're talking about here are plus ones. Or said earlier today, you know, changes that add value, little changes that add value all the way along the journey. You okay? Any questions? You with me? Um, and that adds up. So um, we know about the tangible stuff, the tangible difference. We know that 88% of law firms fail the first impression test. We know that from all the mystery shopping work we've done. We therefore know that it's a golden opportunity for firms who focus just on that point of the client journey. 88% of law firms fail the first impression test which means they are literally burning all that BD and hard work legal brilliance, creating recommendations by being terrible at first points of contact. Is that first impression like actually physically contacting the firm or is it website or both? All of the above. And may also involve all, all the way through to the, the actual lawyer conversation. Yeah. Um, so here's a firm that only had one in 10 of those initial inquiries converting into work. You can see that there. And by focusing on the client experience, only just at that point, they were able to move it from you know, six or seven in 10, converting into profitable files. Yeah? And you know, these, this is work that the firm wants. We don't want, be under no misconception here. You know, client experience is not about being nice to everyone and you know, smiles and you know, we, we help everyone equally. But it is about you know, having good governance, becoming more discerning about the clients we want to attract and so on, and then doing the right things to come up with these results. Yeah. So now what I'd like you to do is move about a bit. Yeah. So um, I'd like you to go and stand near the wall, right? That is closest to the route you would take to go home. So north is Don't confuse them, Eric. <laughs> Don't confuse them. And 
go and stand nearest the wall, now vote with your feet, that you think is kind of closest to the route you might take to go home, you know, in terms of the direction in which you live, or the state in which you live. Julian, get ready for grouping. It could be up here. Don't be shy. <laughs> OK, and um, now that you're there, have a nice conversation. Oh, you live over there. Oh, that's nice. Oh, you know. OK, good. All right, so in your groups, I'm just going to set you a quick design challenge just to get you stoked up a little bit. Um, I wonder if you've seen this before but, or even experienced this before. Oh, yeah. yeah, it's a nice one. And um, if you've done this before, help, you, help the, the group out in terms of the conversation. So a little design challenge. So imagine that you, or more to the point, imagine a young child who is about to undergo this procedure in this MRI scan. Imagine that for a moment. Um, and imagine, if you will, and this is actually what happened, uh, the parent saying to the child who's crying, it's OK, we agree that you could be brave about this. Imagine that scenario for a moment. Okay? And in your groups, I'd just like you to decide, you know, what are the kind of words or phrases that come to your mind if you were that child looking at this machine? Yeah. G give me some of those words. What? Going to die, yeah. It's that bad. Scary. Scary and dark, dark and alien. alien and yeah. noisy, loud, stuck, terror, all of those words. So a little design challenge for you in your groups then is I'd like you to try and find a way to enhance this patient experience. I'm only going to give you a couple of minutes to do it. What would you do to elevate this patient experience? So it feel in your groups. No, no, but well, nothing is off the table. <laughs> nothing is off the table. So in your group, just use this as a conversational point then. How would you change this experience so it was easier for the child? Do that now in your groups. In your groups. All right. So I might just come round quickly around each group and just get, just get one, one idea from each of you. Hopefully, we won't steal each other's thunder. So, over here, just want one idea about changing this. Uh, put a slide at the end. Put a slide at the end. So, there's actually not that dark tunnel, but there's something fun at the end. Yeah. So, okay, good, love it. <laughs> oh, back. Put lollies at the end. Lollies at the end. Okay, I'm getting the idea here. Okay, down the front. Start to dress up in a costume and make it a fun event. Lovely. Okay, yeah. So, we've got some dress up happening over here at the back. Yeah, uh, the children. And that would work well with the staff being dressed up too. Yeah. A bit of a theme. Yeah, love that. So we've got a story now that we're beginning to tell here. Um, to have like a, a teddy bear or someone take the journey first and show that it's safe. Oh, that's so nice, isn't it? Yeah. That's lovely. Okay, and at the front. Yeah, make it, make it playful. So change the look of the machine mm. and the walls around it. Yeah. Sort of yeah. No yeah. Sheets. No white sheets. All right, so you may or may not then be surprised to see what this design exercise, what the outcome of that was. And picking up on all your lovely ideas here, have a look. <laughs> and it's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. It's actually something you will not only mind perhaps now doing, but actually be excited to do, <laughs> potentially. Um, and it, it, it captures all of the things you were talking about. It's not just the environment that's being changed here. It is actually the people who are supporting the actors in the story. So when, when the child arrives at hospital, the nurse is there waiting to put the pirate hat and start the story. So the nursing staff are all involved in creating the experience. Again, going back to games makers and for, perhaps you know, having you make those parallels again with your team and how you do that or don't do that, creating the experience. Yeah. Um, I would say that for a lot of clients, I wonder whether their legal experience <laughs> <laughs> might look a bit like that. You know, if you were to draw what the client might be thinking, they might draw that, yeah? Gruesome looking lasers, a long dark tunnel of endless bills, right? <laughs> no way out. <laughs> Maybe. Um, so 
I guess what we should now start to think about then is, you know, the client's journey. Um, and so here's an extension of what you saw earlier. We were just looking at the first stage or stages around awareness and consideration. But here now you can see it played out all the way through. And it is only at a kind of a rudimentary level, but I thought you might find this interesting just to see it displayed like this visually. And that's, that's what a journey map or an experience map is designed to do. It's, it's a visual representation of all of the touch points and the highs and lows um, of that experience. Here, they're all at one level, of course, no high or low, just in the middle. But we know from the work that we're doing that there are just some wonderful opportunities throughout this client journey. From, again, those first touch points that we were talking about earlier and you had a little bit of ex experience talking about, through to, um, you know, most law firms, once engaged, start work, which is good, because <laughs> that's what we pay them to do. But the opportunity to actually onboard the client, you know, to welcome the client, to actually reassure the client, oh, like it's, I really quite feel appreciated that I've engaged you, you know, and welcome to being a client and having this um, designed in. Law firms typically do things by accident or just by default or because it's business as usual. This is about designing the experience today. You know, that's a lovely touch point there, the welcome and onboarding of new clients, for instance. And the matter tracking and concierge, think our pizza tracker from earlier, perhaps. Um, all the way through to, and it's funny, working with a firm in Perth who got all excited about the, the final shebang, you know, the end of a matter, the final shebang. And of course, what they realised as a team was it was more of a final whimper. <laughs> we don't really do much other than bill. So I guess the design opportunity here is to think, wow, in what way could there be an aftercare package? In what way could it actually we be Qantas Club? What do we do in addition to billing? You know, oh, there's no money in conveyancing. We couldn't possibly send people a bottle of wine. <laughs> really? Isn't that your biggest opportunity to create, a, to, to create even more so a promoter? Going that little extra step, you know? So we wanted to give you some experience now of actually looking at the client's journey. And in order to do that, again, we need to adopt the client's point of view. And this has come up earlier today, the creation of personas, which are typically described as kind of semi-fictional clients or characters that are created to allow designers, such as you, um, teams such as you, to understand their clients better. So we've created some personas for you, and you'll find them in your um, show bags. Um, and we've also given you um, a rudimentary, a kind of a shrink-wrapped version of that there. That's also in your bag, rolled up like a, like a plan. But it's empty for you to go to town on it, all right? So in your groups now, you're going to go off with your show bag. You're going to have a look at the persona that's contained within your client. And you're going to ask yourselves, how might we elevate this client's experience of the firm? And then you're going to work your way through the client journey. And imagine, right? Be creative if you have to. Imagine what some of the pain points might be what some of the improvement points might be, but really importantly, what the client's objectives might be at each stage of that journey. That's your first point of call. Now, everything you need is in your bag, including a briefing sheet as well. We've put that together for you. So you might need to decide who's like a bit of a group leader, who's like a bit of a timekeeper. We don't have long. We've got about 20 minutes, which is not as much as we would like, but we'll see how we go. You might also, Jules, want to go off around the building and find a space with which you could work. Yeah, and you sorted that out? That, yeah. Yes, please, yeah. So, All right, I think we might start our wrap up. Um, a bit of an experiment, that, in terms of doing this little exercise at scale. So thank you for bearing with us while we attempted it. Um, how did you find the 20, 25 minutes or so that we spent on looking at the client's journey. What was that experience like? Could you just give, describe that for me and the highs and lows to go with uh, Mel's points, highs and lows of the exercise for you? I think it definitely needed you to empathise. Yeah. So when you read it at first, you think, oh, a difficult client, I'm a client. Yeah. Yeah.
You know, it's really interesting you say that because it's one of the, the biggest learning points for a firm doing this. And typically this would be a whole day or at least a half a day exercise and the whole journey would be planned out within an entire team. But it's the need to come constantly back to the client's objectives, constantly back to what do they actually want to receive from us, do we think? Um, that's a really important point of empathy. Yeah. Um, any other learning points? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, and you know, it's a qualification on both sides. Um, you know, articulating the value that you're able to deliver to this client um, and have that conversation is is a, a real learning point for most for most law firms. Um, that point of communication. Any other insights or thoughts on the difficulty of that exercise or any other learning? I, I think just reading the description, you have your own interpretation of what those words are Yeah. without you know, having a conversation yeah. and getting verbal um, and you know, physical, um, I suppose, reactions to certain points in there. We mm. can assume some of the, the key points. We made assumptions about what was important based yeah. on what we read. Yeah. If you don't have that, you know, interaction with them individually, yeah. it's hard to pick up everything. Right. Full, full aspect of what, they, what they really need. I agree. And, and I guess the work as it's panned out for us um, is that we tend to do, we, we have tended to do the journey mapping first before going out to speak to clients because there's an awful lot to learn from the internal viewpoint. And it's a point of empathy with the team itself. Does that make sense? The first point of empathy in a way is with how, is it, how as operators, what's it like and what are our assumptions with the client? It's actually called assumptive journey mapping. It's actually a technique. And then obviously verifying those touch points and seeking the client insight to, to build that journey up and challenge some assumptions. Absolutely. Um, there are other things here, aren't there, I'm sure, um, such as what is this all about? Have we been given the right instruction? Do we actually understand what touch points are? Some people going into great detail, other people wanting to move through the, the journey and all of those dynamics happening as well. And those are all very much a part of the mapping process that need to be really well facilitated. You know, lawyers are, tend to be very analytical. You can go down all these rabbit holes, you know, keeping it moving um, and elevating it as well as you, as you move through, keeping the energy really important. Some of you are working at tables, some of you are working at walls. You tend to have more energy if you're at the wall. Um, you know, some of you are writing on the chart, some of you are on the post-it notes. Post-it notes are better because you can then move them around. There's all sorts of obvious and perhaps more hidden points in, in getting this right. Um, but it is an exceptional exercise to do with your team. Um, um, it really allows that level of engagement that's required. It, this is really about baking this mindset, this perspective into your firm, if you're a part of a firm, baking in that service culture. And you do that through an exercise like this, or you can do it through an exercise like this. But it is part of a bigger picture of other activities and points of focus for you as an organization, which we'll leave there for now, because we are certainly out of time. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. <laughs>